Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to really cover the whole waterfront. I'm just going to blast you with a lot of data tonight, uh, not so that you can particularly absorb it, but so it gives you a flavor of the whole picture of our energy and mineral situation, particularly minerals. I'm going to start with that because they're way below, or have been way below anybody's radar screen in Washington for most of this decade. Um, but first, um, I want to collect my feet, which is to tell you a little bit about who we are. And I'll start by telling you who we're not. We're not the USGS, and we're not part of the USGS. My good friends here in the audience from the USGS. We're one of nine divisions within the Department of Natural Resources, like the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, Division of Wildlife, things like that. And our total focus is on the safety and economic well-being of human family. I know that sounds kind of highfalutin, but um, we believe it and we try to practice it every day. We do studies on uh, groundwater geology throughout the state. Our water is beginning to become critical. The predictions are that the head on the Denver Basin Aquifer out here will hit the head this year in 2011. Nobody really knows what's going to happen there, um, but we've been working for a decade to try to be ready for that. Um, geologic hazards is a big part of what we do. Um, we uh, review geologic reports done for new developments and unincorporated parts of the state. And prior to the housing collapse, we were doing about 500 of those a year, visiting each one of them on site and returning a report to the county within three weeks. We also study geologic hazards statewide so that we can understand better where and how they occur and also how to better mitigate them. Uh, we also operate the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, which keeps them safe on the highways uh, during this season and also during the backcountry. We offer safety classes on avalanches uh, to over 5,000 people each year. Uh, we try to educate in a variety of ways. Um, I counted up within the first five years of this uh, century, we had offered assistance to 20 different state agents, ranging from the Attorney General to the State Parks and on. And CEDO, of course. Um, and then we're charged to promote mineral and energy resources in the state. And as part of that, we put out this report every year on the mineral and energy uh, situation in the state. It's full of data, it's about 50 pages long. And anything you need to know, you can find in that publication. It's free online, or you can buy a hard copy. Um, and in this report, we'll find that the revenues that are generated by the mineral and energy sector of our economy in the state, up until about 15 years ago, was about $2 billion a year. And it's much, much more than that um, because prices were down in 2009 and 2010. We're down from the over $16 billion that we had in 2008, but we're on the way back up now as prices. So. <coughs> And just to put it in perspective with a couple of other important segments of our economy, it's about 50% more than tourism, and it generates nearly double the revenues that agriculture does in the state of Colorado. Uh, and that's divided up this way for our sector. Um, coal is a little over a billion, and natural gas is about 7 billion of that 11.6 billion. And oil is a little under 2 billion. The minerals are a billion and a half, uh, about a billion of that is molybdenum, 200 million is gold, and the rest of it is pretty much sand and gravel. And we produce about $300 million worth of CO2, which is mostly sent to West Texas for the oil fields down there. And we all know that the history of Colorado uh, is mining. And a lot of people are aware that also the history of Colorado is energy. But this is an old coal mine, I mean, uh, copper mine out in western Colorado that was operating during the late 1800s. This is a very famous discovery well. It was in 1902, and that was right after the big discoveries in Texas. So people who had missed out on that play came to Colorado for this discovery. That well was still producing up until about two years ago. And it was a discovery well for good green boulders, boulder oil people. And this is what it might have looked like during that time, although it 
Turns out that this photographer knew about photoshopping before computers <laughs> and stick things in that didn't belong. So it looked probably something like that, but maybe not just exactly. Here's one that probably hasn't been documented in the present day city limits of Boulder. Boulder had 114 oil companies and two refineries and uh, its own fair share of scams. Um, as I go through this data, there are a number of things that you might kind of be thinking about as you see these data. One is that um, we're probably, we're already beginning to, again, suffer from uh, inflation that's driven by natural resources. We were pretty strongly uh, suffering from that prior to the collapse in 2008, and we're right back at it again. But the other thing is that, are we gonna be able, at any price, to get the commodities that we need? And I'll give you some examples of why I'm concerned about that. And then we are so rich here in Colorado in energy and minerals, as you see in this, that when the pain gets bad enough back east, pressure to develop resources here is going to be immense, I think. You remember Dick Lamb, when he was governor in 1982, wrote a book called The Angry West, because Jimmy Carter had declared that the West was become, going to become a national sacrifice area for energy. And uh, that is probably... Um, going to get cranked up again. How many people in here voted to have oil shale development in our state? Right. Um, and the other thing is that um, increasingly our extractive industries are owned by foreign countries. So when we have a global shortage of these commodities, what are the implications of having foreign armed companies uh, that are in charge of most of our natural resources? And then our responsibility as Coloradans and Americans is to take what could be a bad situation for us and figure out how to make this a positive experience for America and Colorado rather than negative. Well, I want to talk about three countries primarily tonight. I could talk about BRIC countries of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. But really, the United States, Russia, uh, China, and India are give you a real good feeling for what's going on. And they're the main driving countries for what's going on in the world today. Uh, population, it's the people that are increasing the demand for natural resources. And uh, China has 1.3 billion now, India 1.1. And we have our 0.3 billion down there. Um, land area, China and the US both have about 10 million square miles. And what we call the subcontinent of India is only about a third that size. The GDP, we're still the big elephant on the block, but China's been increasing. They had a four-year run where they averaged 10.4% growth per year and didn't vary more than half a percent. It's an incredibly robust and incredibly strong. Um, and India is coming along also. I've heard most people were talking about China would pass us by about 2030. Uh, I heard one yesterday that was predicting 10 or 20. 27, very precise number. But GDP and energy, historically, have all been very closely tied. So um, if you don't have energy, it's been hard to grow an economy, and if you grow an economy, you need energy. And I think that what's happened in world consumption of electricity frames quite nicely what's going on in the whole energy and natural resources arena. In the last 19 years, the world's increased its um, use of electricity by 8.3 terawatts. Over half of that is just from these three countries increasing consumption. And when you break that out, you can see that China is the big elephant on this one. And notice that they had a very robust growth during the 20th century. And in the 21st century, they just exploded in their generation of electricity. And when you look at all of their natural resource use, it's exactly the same thing. Their use of all natural resources exploded in the 21st century, really beginning about 2010, 2003. And it hasn't abated much at all. And one of the things that we can't forget about that other 44% of the world, they're all increasing their consumption of natural resources and electricity in this case. And most of their people want that American dream that uh, we've all lived uh, on borrowed money for a long time. People say, well, doesn't China have their own production of natural resources? And they certainly do. The number one producer in the world of these commodities, number two 
and number three of these. So 14 to 15 very important commodities that are the top one, two, or three producer in the whole world. So if we go to the election, um, now let's take a look at copper, where they were the number two producer in 2005. They've now dropped to number three. But you can see at the end of the 20th century, they had a fairly strong growth in their consumption, the blue line there, the red is their production line. But in the 21st century, they exploded their consumption of copper. And today they have an import 82%, even though they're number three producer in the world. And why do we care? Well, the price of copper, and all these charts I'm going to show you on price increases, are from the London Metal Exchange spot market beginning in January of 2003 through about two weeks ago. And um, <coughs> the price of copper went up 457% prior to 2008. And it then collapsed, as did almost every mineral commodity, with the exception of gold. Um, and in fact, in a four month period, 2008, 2009, Mineral prices dropped more than they did in the Great Depression. I also heard yesterday that housing, for, uh, for the drop in the price of housing, harassed the drop in the price of housing in the Great Depression. And if you I just also heard from, uh, I'm not up to date, I'll hear a talk by David Walker, the former Controller General of the United States for 15 years, and they pointed out that when you really look at the unemployment, we're in the same unemployment range that, uh, that the Great Depression was in. But we've had a rebound in the prices since that time. And that uh, price is back up to where it's higher than what it was in 2008. And the price has increased just since 2008, 231%. Uh, again, why do we care here in Colorado? Well, I gave this talk out in Delta the Chamber of Commerce, and the guy came up this was about five years ago, and the guy came up to me. We had a small manufacturing facility where he made these switches for the coal mines. Obviously, there's a lot of copper that handled 10, 20,000 volts at a time. And he explained to me how difficult it was to run his business with these uh, tremendous price increases and swings. We've all heard about the copper thefts, foreclosed homes getting stripped. Um, we uh, two, 2,000 pounds of copper stolen from two substations in North Denver. We got a little instant justice down in Chevrolet last fall, fall a year ago. If you've been to Home Depot to buy a pipe of copper pipe or copper wire, you know, the price is out of sight. That old copper mine in the 1800s in western Colorado has been drilled out lately, and I heard a talk today about the assessment of that, and they're hoping to mine that with new modern technology. And this is a, an astounding number to me that I heard last fall at School of Arms from an Australian expert on the copper industry. And keep this in mind, because you're going to hear another commodity that has a similar story from about 50% of all the mining in the last 25 years. If we look at iron ore, where they're the number one producer in the world, not number two or number three, they did not have to import too much of it although they were pretty strong importing again till the end of the 20th century and then they exploded very quickly within several years became the number one importer of iron ore in the world as well as the number one producer of iron ore in the world. And it's because of steel and their consumption of finished steel is just astronomical. They're building that's going on and they supply most of the steel for us as well as many other parts of the world. And their consumption of, of, uh, during this time period of about 25 years, have uh, 20 years, 30 years. Somebody must be an engineer in the audience and subtracting 7,000. <laughs> uh, increased eight times over and a very robust growth. And if you look at India down here, it doesn't look very impressive until you take a look and see that they're right where China was only 15 years ago. So, uh, once they get and notice that their curve is starting up, uh, it can be pretty dramatic. And the price of uh, scrap steel, uh, and I was out in western Colorado, I couldn't believe what the guy was telling me about what he was getting for scrap steel, and went back and looked at uh, the price of that up. And it's true, it dropped, obviously, as most other things did with the economic collapse here uh, that has rebounded again. 
Um, China, is, you know, the numbers are just absolutely staggering. If you talk to people who go over there even on a monthly basis, it's just amazing how much things in China are changing. And the concrete and the steel that's necessary is built 70,000 supermarkets in one year. Became the number three car manufacturer the next year. Uh, two years later, they became the number two car market in the world. Then the next year, 2009, was a big year for them. They became the number one car market, number one car manufacturer, number one exporter in the world. They passed Japan to become the number two economy. And in 2010, they just passed the World Bank as the world's largest country. Think China's just a bubble. Um, this story here that uh, pictures from my uh, Leadville newspaper, and uh, you know the molybdenum the climax mine is right at Fremont Pass nearby, and Leadville has been uh, interested in the molybdenum mine for a long time. Um, from 2003 to 2005, the price of molybdenum doubled, uh, or the, the exports, the number of exports that the United States was putting out doubled. Most of that was going to China. And I gave this talk to the Colorado Bar Association in 2005, and a woman came up to me afterwards, uh, one of the attorneys, and said, you know, my husband has a small manufacturing facility here in Denver. He, he had a molybdenum-based uh, automotive lubricant that he had to drop from his line. And I said, well, why? Because the price went from $2 to $40 a pound? She said, no, because he couldn't get it. And we're North America's largest producer in this state. And you couldn't get a in here. And I talked to another manufacturer a couple of years later, I was able to track down, who had made exclusively molybdenum based products. And he was able to get it, but he said it was extremely difficult. So this is the concern that I have, not so much for price, but are we going to get the things that we need in this country? Well, this is the story. Uh, as the price was uh, got over twenty dollars a pound, got up actually forty dollars a pound. Uh, Phelps Dodge knew that Climax would be profitable at twenty dollars a pound, but they didn't want to do it just on a spike. They wanted to make sure the price was going to stay up for a year or two before they spent the money that would be necessary to reopen Climax. They did a study on reopening it. They decided to do it. Freeport bought them out. Freeport restudied it said, yes, this is what we need to do. And they began tearing down all the old buildings and building new crushers and other facilities up there. And this is a 50-ton ball mill for the new crusher. It's one of two 50-ton ball mills that's on its way from the Gulf Coast up to um, the mine. And it stopped on the main street in Leadville in front of the, uh, the city hall. The high school band played the welcoming. The mayor welcomed it. Um, the uh, county commissioner welcomed it, and uh, <laughs> Representative Scanlon at that time welcomed it. And the guy on the far left is the president of uh, uh, Climax Molybdenum, and he said, you know, I've been in this business for 30 years, and I've never seen anything like this. And I like it. <laughs> the mess on the street there is from the wine bottle that we used to christen it. <laughs> we don't waste champagne in uh, Leadville. And the sign says, a partnership for the future, Leadville, Lake County, and Climax Molybdenum. Well, the ball mill left and went on up to 11,000 feet to the, the mine at Fremont Pass. And within three weeks, the price of molybdenum went from over $30 a pound to under $10 a pound. And it happened during a week that the board of Freeport was meeting out, out there to view their operating mine in Henderson and the new mine they were opening. So they put the mine opening on suspension um, because of that. And But the price, as many, almost all commodities are, has started back up and it's hovering around $16 and $17 a pound now. So hopefully they'll begin opening that back up. This is a chart that shows the location of the Henderson mine. That's North America's largest molybdenum the mine right now. Climax is the largest reserve of primary molybdenum in the world. There's a deposit near Mount Evans that a company just got permission to do um, exploration drilling for the molybdenum um, mine there, and probably read about the opposition to that. There's also a world-class deposit at Rico in southwestern Colorado, 
and that was looked at to uh, to try to open up years ago. It turned out that the folks that were trying to sell the uh, acreage to a company didn't own the acreage, and that threw a little monkey wrench. In. <laughs> <laughs> but all of these other little triangles on there are known locations of molybdenum. Now, not, not probably none of those are going to be climates, and a lot of them are not going to be economic. But I could put out for just about any mineral commodity now in Colorado and see the same sort of pattern. We are extremely rich in mineral resources here, and people know that. So when the pressure gets tough enough, look out. Well, these are prices again on the spot market from the London Metal Exchange. And I've calculated the percentage, the maximum percentage price increase of these. And you can see these common ones that we know, gold, silver, lead, tin, zinc, the precious and base metals. The average price increase of them is 379%. I'm going to give you a little marker. During that same period of time, oil went up 306%. And lots of people wrote to Congress from the person and said, you've got to do something about the price of oil. Does anybody know of anybody that wrote to Congress person about the price of aluminum going up too much, or zinc going up too much? Or these 15 commodities, animal and business, cadmium, the average price increase here was 726%. Now, why didn't we know about this? There's a reason. Um, this shows you the percentage price increase just in the last two years of all these different commodities, and there's oil over there in the red bar on the far right. So these metal commodities have been going up far more, far faster than oil prior to 2008 and since 2009 when they started to recover. And the reason that we don't know this and we don't see it is that oil and natural gas are almost all sold on the spot market. So the minute that crude oil price goes up in Saudi Arabia, we know it at the gas pump, and we all fill our gas pumps all the time. So we have an everyday or weekly reading on what the price, spot price of crude oil is doing. Coal and uranium are not sold mostly on the spot market, nor are most of these minerals. They're all sold largely on long-term fixed price contracts. And coal in Colorado, I think, gives us, that was just a point that the lowest increase, with the exception of that uranium uh, decrease, um, was 32%. The average of these, even with the uranium continuing to go down, was 132% price increase. Well, coal spot price in Colorado went over this two-year period more than double, from $17 a ton to $37 a ton. But, when the spot price was $37 a ton in 2005, the average price of coal sold in Colorado was only $24.45 a ton because most of that is sold on long-term fixed price contracts in the spot market. The spot market is telling you when those contracts expire, you're going to pay more to renew them. The coal that's going into that second new stream down in Pueblo that um, XL just finished building, is double the cost of the coal going into the old part of the plant because it had to be a new contract signed to get that new coal. And so what that spot price was telling us, when, when those contracts expire, the prices are going to go up. So only two years later, the price, the average price, was up to $29.75 and gone up $5 a ton. We do the economic forecast of minerals and energy as part of the Colorado sector for the University of Colorado Business School. When my coal guy came to me last fall and we were putting these together and said, guess what the price of coal is, the average price in Colorado last year? $48 a ton. The average price, not the spot price. And so, and I just didn't believe him. I said, we've got to check this. I, I can't believe it. And we did check it in a number of places, and everyone confirmed that that's what it was. Well, that's the same thing we're seeing in these minerals. It's this slow, insidious inflation that the spot market is telling you is built in and it's going to keep hitting us as these contracts turn over. And it was. And Bernanke said in 2008, the summer of 2008, I'm worried about inflation, and I think we may need to do something about it. I saw no indication that he really understood what was causing it. 
it was this mineral resource driven. It wasn't a wage price model by any stretch of imagination, like most of our inflationary periods have been. But of course, the Chinese know what they're doing to the world's resources, and they're scowling, tying up in every way, shape, or form, all kinds of creative ways here in the United States to tie up resources. Um, we've had Chinese delegation come and talk to us about what might be available in Colorado in the way of natural resources. They're very interested in tying up U.S. coal now. Okay, well, the first part of energy that I want to talk about is renewable energy because renewable energy has a very close tie to minerals. And we have uh, wind, and we're very fortunate that we've got a lot of good head start on wind over the rest of the country. In my view, every Everything that we can do in this country to prevent imports, uh, we're better off. But we haven't prevented imports with this. Because every one of those wind turbines takes a thousand pounds of neodymium to, to the magnets in the turbine. And we don't produce a single pound of neodymium in this country. Hopefully, we're getting ready to solve that in a few years. But we need these things in um, those wind turbines. This is our first big. Uh, commercial solar PV array down in the San Luis Valley. Uh, depending on what type of solar PV technology okay. you're using, you might have any one of these uh, mineral commodities here. And these are some other mineral commodities that are used in a variety of alternative technology, and we have to import over 50% of every single one of them. And most of them, it's 100%. And let's talk about the REEs because it's rare earth chic time in the media right now. They've suddenly waked up to the existence of rare earths. And uh, they are a series of 15 elements that um, many times the one on each side of them are thrown in with them. And so they're usually called 17. They have such wonderful names that we remember from high school chemistry as Presidium, Syrian, Lanthanum, Neodymium. Samarium and gadolinium. Um, these are some of the ways that they look. Uh, here's a list of some of those 17. And the reason I picked these is because they're necessary to make this thing that people love to drive to show people how green they are. <laughs> Japan is just touted as the largest rare earth object on the world. And Japan was actually having to smuggle rare earths out of China in 2007 and probably 2008 and 2009. But I know 2007. And it's used in these, but the big part is in that engine where they need the neodymium. And neodymium is, is the, the key component of good permanent magnets, uh, whether it's earphones for your iPod or, or um, anything that's got a magnet in it, neodymium. Well, China this, uh, came over and visited our one rare earth mine, just as I did back in the 70s. They came in the 80s and visited it. And the folks were very kind and took them around and showed them all about Mountain Pass Rare Earth Mine out in California. And uh, China looked at that and they set a long range strategy that we're going to become the Saudi Arabia of rare earths. And so they began flooding the market with cheap rare earths. And you can see how the decision was made here. You can see how they, uh, their production grew and grew. And eventually, uh, you can see that the U.S. wedge is getting less and less. And so they put Mountain Pass out of business finally in 2002. There were also some environmental problems we had to added to it. But they then uh, became the world's, uh, pretty much the sole uh, supplier of rare earths. And they now have 97.3% of the market. Then you remember they tried to buy Unical in the mid uh, part of this first decade. Well, there were a lot of assets for Unical, but it just so happened that Unical owned the Mountain Pass Rare Earth Project. So that was what China was really after, because if they could get that rich source, then they'd really have a lock on the world supply, as if they don't anymore. This is what one of their rare earth mines looks like over in China. And finally, the um, news media waked up to this and you began seeing in late uh, summer of 2009, a number of articles, New York Times, London Telegraph, Reuters, Bloomberg, all realizing China had announced we're going to stop exporting rare earths. Well, the World Trade Organization said that doesn't sound real cool. So now they're only going to restrict exports of rare earths. 
And of course, the price is just shot out of sight. Well, let's turn from rare earths, um, exotic, um, but not that rare uh, commodity to uh, an ordinary commodity like cement. All of this building that they've been doing, they've increased their consumption of cement tremendously. In 2002, they were exporting cement to the rest of the world. In 2003, they began importing it, and they tied up ships. And suddenly, we had, in 2003, 27 states shown here that had shortages of cement because we had to import 22% of our cement. And by the next year, we had 38 states. You see a little green rectangle that allegedly didn't have a problem, but if you talk to anybody during that time, who had anything to do with cement, and then we had a problem here in Colorado also. Biggest cement producers are our old friends. And China consumes a lot of all this stuff. And that's a little statistic there before you go to sleep at night. Um, fertilizers are one that really uh, concern me a lot. This is, um, these are the price increases of overall agriculture prices. And you can see how they dropped off with the economic collapse. This is the minerals and metals that we were talking about. And you can see how they dropped off in 2008. Energy was stronger than any of that, and they dropped off. Fertilizers were far higher than any of those, and they didn't drop off with the economic collapse. And the people who've been looking at this are very worried about fertilizers worldwide. We've got some shortages right now. The U.S. just announced that they were going to cut their corn exports back by 35 percent, uh, which is just uh, really worrying people. You can see the breakout of how these things have gone up. Now, they have come down recently, and they come down because people have gone on strike and quit using them. So you can get away with that for a couple of years, and then your soil just tanks very quickly. Um, I had a rancher come up to me after this talk in Meeker and told me about all the, before I really was tuned into these, and told me how he had changed all these ranching practices because of the high cost of fertilizer. $165 a ton for this potassium chloride went up to 50 per ton. Um, and we, uh, the gray bars are our production, the black line is our consumption. And you can see that our production has been going down uh, of phosphate in this country. We used to export it in the green shown down there. Now we have to import it. Um, potash, the same thing. Our production's been going down. Our exports have been going up. Um, nitrogen, same way. Our production's been going down in this country. Our imports, excuse me, our exports have not gone potash. Our imports have gone up. Our imports have increased in the red. And um, you can see that China's increase of fertilizer has skyrocketed. India's has uh, gone up fairly substantially. Ours has been pretty flat. And perhaps one of the reasons is that we're importing a lot more of our food. Well, let's go to conventional energy. This is where we get our energy in the United States right now. And these are the areas where we use that energy. And the part that worries me about this pine is this part, which is our imported part. We've got about 8% natural gas, which used to be 15. Uh, it used to be two thirds of oil because our consumption has dropped. It's dropped back to about 61% and over 90% uranium. The engineers in the crowd here are the actual numbers. You see that oil is our largest energy source, which is somewhat surprising. But remember that this is everything. This is electricity, heating. Um, Industrial. Um, the percentage price increase, there's that 306% I told you about with oil. Notice that coal went up more, uranium went up more during the same period of time, and natural gas went up about two thirds of that. And in terms of imports, coal is the only major energy source that we don't have to import. And I sort of view this as my reality check chart because 93% of the energy that we use in this country comes from those four conventional sources that we've always got energy from. And only 7% comes from what we call renewables. And of those, hydroelectric and biomass are by far the majority of those. Um, 
and hydro has been decreasing in this country because of the environmental restrictions relative to the dams that generate the power. And um, so that segment has uh, been reducing. Well, let's turn to dirty old coal. Um, a lot of people think about coal as a 19th century fuel. It's not. It's a 20 and 21st century fuel. The world is increasing its use of it. China is certainly increasing their use of it, and they rightfully get bad press for that. But interestingly, China is the leader in the world in renewables, <coughs> by far. Renewables. Renewables, yes. Um, up until December of 2006, China produced all the coal that they needed. So their consumption and their production were in balance. In December 2006, they began importing for the first time. And you can see here that the, this is the imports and exports, and you can see that net, the imports are more than the exports. So that was the first time that they really had to bring it in. So going 2006 into 2007, and you can see that they really increased their imports. Was, and this is the price, spot price of Appalachian, uh, Central Appalachian coal. When China began importing coal, the price was $38 a ton. It went to $140 a ton. There was metallurgical grade coal <coughs> in West Virginia sold into China for $240 a ton. And of course, with the economic collapse, it collapsed the price, but you can see that it's already increased uh, considerably since that time. And they're planning to use a lot more. Actually, these little cartoons are the only two predictions in there because I don't do predictions because I know how foolish predictions are. Um, India likes coal, they have to import a little of it. Uh, we liked coal, but in the last three years, our consumption has decreased because we've taken 127 proposed new coal plants off the table since 2007. And we don't have to import it. Together, these two countries consume and produce 60% in the world. And where the coal reserves are, uh, we have the largest reserves in the world, Russia's second, and China is third. Uh, in Colorado here, our production increased up to 2005, but it's been decreasing since that time. Uh, problems in the mines, <coughs> the mine has shut down, doesn't want to really um, get any more contracts because they want to get out of the business here. Nuclear uh, is a lot favored of a lot of people because it has a low carbon footprint. It's an unfavorite of other people because it has nuclear. Excuse me, fewer. Um, <laughs> China likes nuclear. They're increasing. India likes nuclear. They both want a lot more. And uh, in these busily busy building 17 new reactors. In the U.S., our last plant came on in 1996 and was permitted in the 70s. And I usually give a quiz, but since this is such a sweet audience, I know you know the answers. But since that time, has the generation of nuclear power in the United States increased, decreased, or has it remained flat? <coughs> and I've given this test enough to know that uh, I can tell you what the percentages are. 95% of people would say the same thing I did. It's either decreased or stayed flat. And uh, indeed, it has gone up, not decreased or stayed flat. When I first saw that graph, I couldn't believe it. I said, you know, why wouldn't I know this? Why don't we know this? Why, why is this the best kept secret in the United States? And everybody in <coughs> France is the largest generator of nuclear power. It's like 70 or 80 percent from uh, nuclear. But we forget that they're a tiny, inconsequential little country in all the ways. <laughs> so I usually get a standing ovation. <laughs> we are the largest generator of nuclear power in the world by far. We're double the number two country and triple the number three country. Okay, so we have 436 plants to generate all this electricity, 55 under around the world under construction. And lots of other countries want it because it is low carbon footprint. And it also has a little bit more security, I think, than um, oil or natural gas. And uh, you know, Europe's been cut off from natural gas by Russia. So they're a little goosey uh, right now on natural gas. Um, the, the 436 plants that are in existence use about 180 million pounds of uranium a year. 
but we only produce about 80 to 100 million. So we got this 70 to 80 million uh, pound gap, excuse me, 100 to 110 we produce, 70 to 80 million pound gap in, around the world. And the way we've been taking care of that is that prior to Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, we built up this huge stockpile of yellow cake uranium. We've been working off of that. And we also have been converting nuclear weapons, both Russian and US, and we've been working that off. The weapons are about converted, the stockpile's about gone, and the market knows it. So whereas for a couple of decades we were running at ten dollars a pound for the price of uranium, it shot up to uh, about $139 in the summer of 2008. It has dropped back to where it's only about five times what it was for a couple of decades, <coughs> 50 or 40 bucks, and now it's up for the last time up to $67 a pound on the spot market, and contracts are higher than that. And these are the areas of Colorado where uranium has historically been mined or talked about being mined, and many of these today are being talked about being mined again. Oil, that's the one that we go to war over, and uh, China likes oil, increasing their consumption fairly regularly. They're up over half of that has to be imported now. India has to import about three-fourths of their oil, and we uh, are down now since our consumption has turned down. We only have to import 61% of our oil, 67 imported in 2008. In Colorado, our oil production was overall decreasing for several decades and has been increasing, not because we found more oil in these statistics, but because we include the liquids that come from natural gas, uh, NGLs and condensate. So the um, increase in gas production in Colorado has caused the liquids to turn around and go up. We do now have a very exciting new discovery, not a new discovery, the new technology that's been applied in a new way that's given some very large productive oil wells up in Weld County, and that has a promise to greatly increase our production here. Uh, if you wonder what peak oil looks like, that blue chart, which is a chart for the lower 48 production in the United States, is a pretty good example of it. Uh, production increases to a peak and then declines, and you can't ever reach that peak again. You can see there we've had a little flat. The, the, uh, this is our lower 48. It was a prediction made by Shell uh, scientists in 1956 that production in the United States lower 48 would increase for another 14 years and then reach a peak and can tend to decline. And he was exactly right. 1970 did reach that peak, just as he predicted. Um, this is the component from Alaska, and you can see that that has peaked and begun to decline, and we're Whereas we were producing two, 2 million barrels a day, we're now down to about 400,000 barrels a day from Alaska, and the pipeline can't operate at much lower levels, so that's a great concern for people. There's an increase offshore. The yellow is the federal offshore production, and we have had some increase there. But you can see overall, with the exception of the last year, we've been in decline. And we're producing today 44% less oil in this country than we were in 1970. And of course, we continue to drive, drive, drive. And world oil production has been plateaued since 2005. Nobody quite knows whether that's a peak or is it a shoulder on the way up. Um, we won't really know when world oil peaks, probably for 15 years when we're looking at it in our rearview mirror. But that is a concern. And this chart really uh, kind of puts in context. Colonel Drake drilled that first well in Pennsylvania 1959. And since that time, the world has consumed a trillion cubic, uh, a trillion barrels of oil, 1,000 billion barrels. And we uh, consumed 1% of that trillion by 1924, 1948, 5%. 90% of all the oil in the world has been consumed since 1959. And I can see from looking at the or the hair in here, some of you are like me, we're around in 1959. And 50% of all the oil in the world has been consumed just since 1986. Remember that copper? 50% of all the oil has been consumed, or copper has been consumed in the last 25 years. We can't continue. It's physically impossible to continue on these sorts of paces of consumption. And if you notice, the last 10% took three years 
The first 10% took 100 years to consume. And most of the world's producing countries are already in decline. Um, and we get most of our oil from a very few number of companies. And declines are what a lot of people don't really appreciate when they talk about peak oil and they talk about all of our reserves and all this. And none of this is about reserves. It's about production. How fast can you get it out of the ground? It doesn't make a hill of beans that the USGS last summer or summer a year ago increased the resources of oil shale uh, from a trillion to a trillion and a half barrels. We're not producing one single barrel out of it. It's how fast can you get it out? And declines are in cities. And anybody who's ever been in a company and you know, tried to build a petroleum company like I have, over the first thing you got to do, we call it being on the down as running up the down escalator, because the first thing you got to do every year is replace what you produced last year before you can ever start to grow. And believe me, it's a tough battle. This is the world's largest, second largest producing field in the world in 2005, Cantorail Field in Mexico. That's what it looks like today. And it's actually down to 400,000 barrels a day to 2.2 million net. Multiply that times $90 a barrel and tell me how much Mexico is missing out on. They don't have any other fields like this. The International Energy Agency in Paris in 2007 said that the world's oil fields have a 3%, 3.7% decline. And they are looked upon as the world's experts on these sorts of things. A year later, they redid it, and they said it's really 6.7% rather than 3.7%. And most people that I know who understand these things don't see a 6.7% decline as unreasonable at all. Let's just take 5% halfway in between the two and look at what it means. When you decline our current rate of 86 million barrels a day, that production at 5%, in only five years, you have to have 19 million barrels a day to replace it, to stay even, not to grow. That is a huge thing to overcome. And declines don't care. When you've got a platform being put in, in the Gulf of Mexico and it blows up, and it was supposed to come on at a quarter million barrels a day, the declines don't care, they get below. When you've got a platform that Exxon brought on at a quarter million barrels a day in the Gulf of Mexico, but it was two years late, you know what the declines do during that period of time? You don't, even, you don't even come close to overcoming the decline that occurred in that period, two year delay period. And this is what people really don't take into account. And I'd like to build for you just the world's oil production curve, country by country. And we'll start with the USA that you saw peak in 1970. And today, you know, we're 44% less and declining, going down. We'll add four other major producers in the world that are all in decline. And that, um, those five countries, ours and the other four, as a group peaked in 1997 and then went into decline. 45 other small producers are in uh, decline. They peaked as a group in 2000 and have been declining ever since. We put in um, some others that are not in steep decline, and even when we do that, we've still got a peak in 2004 with a decline since that point in time. So we've got 61 of the 65 producing countries. We put in gutter in Angola, and it's only then that we're flat since 2004 in terms of our production. We put the Saudis in on top of that. They actually declined 600,000 barrels a day, but because they invested $50 billion in getting their production up. We'll call it flat instead of a decline. And it's only when you put the former Soviet Union production on that you get a slight increase uh, in the last four or five years. Now, we have people who are telling us that uh, world oil production is not going to peak until after 2030, and it will peak 50% more than what we're producing today. Now, I'm not going to make any predictions. That's the data. You can make your own conclusions from it. I have a hard time understanding where on earth that would come from. And remember the declines. In only five years, we need 19 million barrels a day more just to keep that flat. And of course, it's not just about production. Because China's going around and tying up things. 
So the production that's in the world is getting tougher and tougher for people to get. And remember, their imports are increasing constantly. India's imports are increasing constantly. And there's another thing. Here is Indonesia. They were exporting oil uh, just about 20 years ago. And they were exporting a million barrels of oil back in 1990. Today, they're importing 200,000 barrels of oil per day. So there's a swing of 1.2 million barrels of oil that used to be in the market for China, India, and us to, to fight over, to get. It's no longer in the market. And the UK is exactly the same as this. As they increase their production and their consumption, their production, as they increase their consumption and their production declines, their exports drop much, much more rapidly. And of course, the price has driven up, dropped in 2008, along with most other commodities, but it's already rebounded and we're up in the high 90s now. And of course, that makes people think about oil shale again, and um, we are the world's largest resource of oil shale. Um, there's a rifle located square of six miles on the side. This is the thickest, richest oil shale anywhere in the world by far. When you talk about oil shale, resources in the world, you're talking about our state. Okay, natural gas. Now, we think we figured out this thing, and we got this clean burning natural gas, and it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. We have this little secret, we're gonna run our economy on natural gas. And guess what, the rest of the world has discovered this also. And you can see that they've been increasing their production rather dramatically. China likes natural gas, and uh, they don't have to import too much of it right now. India likes natural gas. They have to import a little bit, and this is our consumption picture. We declined because we shut in schools and we shut in factories because we didn't have the natural gas to supply them back in the 70s. People thought natural gas was unreliable, and they wanted, did everything they could to get off of it. I went to a lot of them in the 80s when we had excess gas, we had low gas prices. Sound familiar? Like today. And we had natural gas cars, and natural gas buses, and natural gas trucks, and we talked about we can get rid of all those nasty coal-fired power plants for fuel and natural gas, and it worked. The sea consumption went up uh, into the 90s. And there was just one little problem. We didn't have the gas to fuel those natural gas-fired power plants. Um, and Colorado's production has been going up, really, for up until 2008, the only basin in the United States that was increasing in gas production was the Rockies. Colorado had played a very big role in that. So, you know, we look on this as our silver bullet. Boone Pickens says, let's convert our cars to this. Uh, people say, well, let's use it to back up wind and solar for their intermittency. Well, uh, let's put, go to natural gas instead of nuclear. Get rid of those nuclear plants. Let's get rid of all those coal fired power plants and go to natural gas. And at least half of us still heat our homes with natural gas. We kind of like it to heat our homes. Um, we've only gotten back to the production levels of where we were in 1973, just within the last year. And the price has been going up. The average price delivered to residential <coughs> for a couple for two decades was $6 an MCF, and it's now over $12 an MCF for the last 45 years. Um, that help in our economy? And this is the increase in electricity generated from natural gas. And this is our increase in natural gas imports. We were fueling those plants with imports from Canada. 70% of the natural gas burning uh, gas generation was from Canada. Um, you can see our production here that's flat. Another problem we have is that back in 95, uh, it took 8,900 wells to get this amount of production to 30,000 with this amount of production here. One of my friends a few years ago told me, about five years ago, when he first tipped me off to this, he said, he was looking at Eon Space in Western Colorado, and he said, that's our dirty little secret is that we have to drill more and more wells just to stay flat. And I said, I don't like that in Denver Post. Um, and a report a couple of years ago by IHS, a big international um, company, it's all kinds of data worldwide. I showed these data that in one decade, you had the average reserves per well had dropped to about a third of what they were in 1998. And remember, it's not about reserves, it's about production. And average production was much lower in the Rocky Mountains than it had been before. 
the wells that are drilling are worse and worse kind of stuff. And the real thing that's a problem, don't forget about trying to figure this dog's breakfast out, but there's one important <laughs> thing on here that talks about how much of the gas we get has been drilled, and since 60% of it's been drilled in the last four years um, to provide our gas. But back in the early 90s, the underlying decline rate for the natural gas fields in the United States was 16 and 17%. Today, it's 30 and 32%. That is a huge, that's every year. Before you can increase at all, you have to replace one third of your production in the country. That is a huge challenge. These new wells are coming on in the Marcellus and those other things have just dramatic decline numbers. Right now, we have more excess gas than we've probably ever had in our industry. The price is low. The policymakers say, boy, this is the way to go. It's an endless supply of cheap energy. And you can't drill those wells at low prices. And when you have that kind of decline rate, you could really go negative very fast. And that's going to cause price spikes. It's going to be, I think, very volatile market in the future coming. So I'm worried about putting all of our infrastructure into natural gas until we really see whether some of these shale wells are going to produce like the people who are drilling them. The client and other people are very suspicious of that. I think we're going to need every single thing that we can get and uh, probably more. We're working very hard on geothermal energy to try to generate electricity and make them some great strides. We've started been doing that for about five years and Junction with the governor's energy office. Um, we have direct use of geothermal now, hot springs that do 20 pools of wet water to grow alligators in San Luis Valley or 40 buildings in Pagosa Springs and on and on. But you have to have hot water to do that. Most places don't. You have to have hot water to do electric generation. We've got some incredibly exciting things going on there. We still haven't succeeded yet. And I think one of the most underappreciated things we have in this country is geo-exchange heat pumps. You don't need hot. You just need 55 degree ambient temperature. You drill a well vertically, or you can do a loop in your yard. And um, they put this in at the governor's mansion a few years ago. It saved 70% in energy bills. They just drilled the wells for the Capitol building now in their renovation to have this going in there. The folks, this is widespread out in Western Colorado. The folks love it, not just from when you talk to them, they don't necessarily talk about the money savings so much. They talk about how comfortable it is, how nice it is. It's a low plan that goes all the time. So you don't have the forced air coming to roar on. you got to go over and turn up the TV. And when it goes off, it's too loud. you got to go turn it down again. After hearing that and then going back to my forced air, it really bugs me now. <laughs> but they, they really love that. And China knows about this. As I mentioned, they're the largest... Uh, the most advanced and largest renewables in the world. They have, this is a 690 unit apartment complex and they expect to save 30 to 40 percent and it's both good in summer and winter for air conditioning. And <coughs> so here we are, um, we're depleting our natural resources of all sorts at an ever increasing pace and uh, demand continues growing and uh, we're running up that down escalator and at the same time that our demand for energy is going up, uh, we're trying to reduce our greenhouse gas because it's really hard to make the math work. Um, it's just tough. So we're uh, in a spot where I don't think we've ever been in one. I know we have never been in a spot like this before. And this is a quote from Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat. And I think for up until a year ago, in terms particularly of minerals, I don't even think we knew that there was a game going on in the field. I think we just sit back in the stands talking amongst ourselves. And, Drinking our drinks and uh, the rest of the other people in the world are playing the game. So, thanks very much. All right, thank you uh, very much for such an uplifting uh, presentation. You ought to hear my earthquake talk. <laughs> uh, my, my question is really, Manusha, in your third or fourth slide, you showed that Colorado exported $300 million of CO2. I wonder who's getting carbon dioxide from us? West Texas for the tertiary recovery of the large oil fields in West Texas. There's a pipeline that takes it down there. Sort of ironic, you know, we're, we're producing CO2 and we're selling it down there, and I've got an $11 million grant from the DOE to look at sequestering CO2 up in northwestern Colorado. <laughs> In back. 
Um, my son lives and works in Leadville, and they, uh, Climax is now hiring, I understand. Right. Not full blast, but they are yeah. hiring. That's great. Right now, it's there's, there's, I'm going to be a little picky, not picking on you, but I will see if this used in the media. So I want to try and clarify something. We have oil shale and we have shale oil in Colorado. The oil shale is the stuff out west that we it's the world's largest. And it's not oil, and it's not shale. So the reason it's not oil is it's rich in this kerogen and becomes oil when it's heated. And what happens is nature buries the oil, the kerogen, deep enough to where the temperature comes and converts it to oil. It was never buried deeply enough to do that out in the beyonds. So you've got to artificially heat it and convert it to oil, either in a retort at the surface or shell, and the other companies are trying to do it in place. Shale oil is like shale gas. Nature did convert it into oil, but it's in substances loosely referred to as shale, although nobody's producing oil from shale. It's actually a brittle layer within the shale. Um, limestone, dolomite, or, or uh, siltstone. And that's what they're looking for. And we do have a new emerging play in northern Weld County that I think quite easily could circle the whole Denver Basin. And there they're drilling horizontal wells in this and getting very high rates of oil. And North Dakota uh, has had this sort of thing going on. It's called the Bakken play. And that is the, their uh, oil production there has increased dramatically over the last decade as a result of this. And hopefully that could happen here. That's a pretty conventional thing, except that it's using horizontal drilling instead of vertical. We've been producing from that formation, which is largely called the Niagara, for vertical wells for decades. But we just started this new technology of horizontal drilling that's used in the shale gas. So shale gas, shale oil. So that oil shale is out there. So a lot of times the media doesn't know the difference. It's easy to try to. I'm the first thing. Thank you for an uh, excellent presentation. I was wondering if you are aware of any studies that consider the implications on the supply of all these raw materials for capita consumption in populous developing countries like China and India would ever approach per capita consumption in developed countries. And you don't really need to do a lot of you know, modeling or calculation because their per capita is very, very low right now. It's nowhere near what ours is in consumption of any kind. Obviously, it's going to continue to grow as you mentioned it, to having it continue to grow. They've probably got three or four hundred million people that, you know, more people than we've got. People like to say, oh, there's all these poor. Yeah. But there's 200 million people that have moved to the cities. That's two thirds of our population. And they've gotten that middle class lifestyle now. And of course, that puts a lot of pressures on the, the guys who want to keep their thumbs on. But uh, I can't see how it's not going to continue to grow. There are certainly going to be you know, spurts and stops and downturns and that sort of thing. But it's a pretty frightening thing, I think, for this country because they have tied up on most of the vast majority of resources. They want to become the manufacturer. They don't want anybody else in the world to be the manufacturer. They want to be the manufacturer. Supply the world. I've uh, seen these things. Uh, Walmart ships that come over just, you know, they can get over here in three or four days, fully loaded. They're gigantic ships that have hulls that have been specially coded to get them uh, over here more economically. And they go back empty. We're back in the center. Resource supply demand upsets, bad news maybe, but investment opportunity definitely. Obviously, this must knowledge and data 
you thought about how you might benefit from some of these shortages? Any suggestions in terms of... <laughs> Yeah, I have an excellent Beautiful. suggestion. Never take a stock tip from Vince Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> but I will, I will just point out, I, I got in a little mutual fund for precious metals. And uh, about 2004 or five, And it really just, I mean, I could not believe how much it was going up. I really, I've never had an investment like that. I didn't have that much money in it, but it was just mind-blowing how fast it's going up. I had to sell my condo, I had to get out of it uh, in about 2006, and uh, I had to take some money out of my 401k and uh, buy a new house. And um, I went to get back in, when I put the money in, in the next 60 days, and it was closed. I couldn't get back in, because you know, people found out about it. Well, I didn't get burned in the 2008 collapse <laughs> <laughs> from dumb luck. But I was, after it collapsed, a lot of people got out. And I was able to get back in uh, 14 months ago. And so far since that time, it's returned 54%. Which of these commodities do you like now? I think uh, I'm, I'm in a mutual fund because I think it's very foolish. And in fact, that fund didn't perform very well for a while. And, and they admitted that they had over-invested in platinum and platinum had not done what they thought it was going to do. And I was a little disappointed, almost ready to get out. But, you know, it's... Thank you. Another question in the back. Uh, yes, can you uh, give us your opinion of uh, what you feel the new Colorado administration, the Hagenlooper administration, will, uh, will uh, be towards the natural gas industry versus what the prior industry, our, our administration was? Well, um, I, I think that they will be balanced. I'm sure that they're going to want to protect the environment just mm -hmm. like I do. Um, Governor Hickam Hoover spent time in the oil and gas industry. He has a lot, a lot of very close friends in the natural gas industry. So he's going to be, I think, supportive of rules and regulations that aren't necessary, and uh, but but be very careful about protecting the environment. It's fine read initially of what's going to happen. And, you know, uh, if you've got a geologist for the governor, you can't work this week. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. I guess I saw a lot of lemons. I've got to go home and drink a lot oh. of martinis. I want to know, where's the lemonade? <laughs> 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 well, that's well, that actually you sounds all. like even if we've got all these yeah. natural resources, we're just running ahead of the big wave that's going to be well, we are, and we're way, way behind. You know, we were selling off our strategic mineral stockpile. We decided in 1992 that the Cold War was over. We didn't need this thing anymore, and we made the decision to start selling it off. And for 15 years, we sold it off, and nobody looked at what we were doing to say, should we continue? Should we do something different? And finally, the military waked up about 18 months ago as a result of the National Academy of Science study called Strategic Materials for a 21st Century Military. And it was the bluntest report I've ever said, so <laughs> seen. It said that the military didn't have a clue about how vulnerable they were. And they now have a clue. They stopped the sale of 13 of those minerals. The last one was tantalum last December a year ago. And we imported 82% of our tantalum and we're selling off the stockpile. So, Steps, that's the first bright spot I've seen in Washington. So at least Washington's aware they've now heard of rare earths. And as I said, it's rare earth sheep time now. It's on the front page of the Denver Post Sunday. And um, it's it just, but we are behind and you can't do these things fast. And, and people just say, well, well all we got to do is open up mines. Well, that's not all. First of all, you got to have people to open them. And we've lost the people from the mining industry. They are in their 80s. Now, I know an 84-year-old guy that went back to work for a company because he was so lucrative to get that experience back. But there are not many 84-year-olds that are willing to go back to work. And so we've lost the generations of people that know how to mine. And it's not just the mine. There was an equipment shortage. You can't, you can't just go to the Ford dealer and buy a 340-ton truck. In, in 2008, there was a 
four year backlog of wooden tires for those mining trucks. The oil sands pit, which is essentially a mining operation, was ordering tires for 2012 in 2008, as were most other mining companies. Our last question is in the center. Please, um, what was the scene, the photograph, and background for you, the be beginning of your Ah, the scene. That was from Andy's porch in Silverton, looking out at the Grenadier and Needles Range, Pigeon and Turret uh, Peaks. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you.